Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. Good morning. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, Tuesday morning, March 22nd. I'm happy to be here. This is One Child to Be a Survivor to Another, and we're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open, and I popped the link in there to what we were talking about. We've been talking about this for a few weeks now, um, maybe yeah, quite a few weeks, actually. Dysfunctional families, and um, this is from the Mudrashram Institute of Spiritual Studies from George A. Boyd, and uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of that end of that article, but it's just really quite interesting. I hope people are getting something out of it. Um, I know that I do. Um, it's very helpful for me, especially the section on boundaries, and that's where we left off on Saturday. So thanks, everybody, for tuning into my shows. I appreciate it. Um, I have, like, I don't know, 20,000, 23,000, almost 23,400 shows listened to. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in. And, uh, you know, I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows. I just want to be one more voice, you know, and I started this November 2009. I wasn't sure how long I'd be doing shows, you know. I, just, I thought maybe three months, six months or something just to see, you know, if the, if the information was helpful for people and, you know, if people were interested in tuning in and, um, you know, I'm a I'm the candidate regional director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and uh, we're you know standing up to against child abuse and standing up for child rights, and speaking out against abuse, and then also I thought, well, I'll do a show on survivor issues because I'm going through my healing journey, and so you know I had no idea how long I'd be doing the shows and who would be listening. So thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. You know, you have to listen to my shows at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse and I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell it like it is. And um, abuse is a sensitive subject for most people. You know, a lot a lot of people don't, you know, some people don't find the information hard to listen to, you know, and, and other people do. So you have to know what's good for you to listen to, right? You have to know what might bother you. So if you think the topics of abuse might bother you, you know, then you need to turn the show off. It is, it's your discretion. You have to, everyone has to listen to all my shows at your own discretion. And young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have someone listen to the show with you just to make sure that, it's age appropriate for you because they're, I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows. And adult content on here, and it's uh, abuse is a scary subject for young people who may not have heard a whole lot about it. They might be confused, thinking why, what happened, what's going on, uh, especially if, if no one's talked to them about abuse and about what happens to people who have been abused. They may be wondering what's going on. So that's why I, I ask all people under the age of 18 to have permission from an adult, a parent or a caregiver, uh, to listen to my show, and you know maybe they can listen to the show with you and make sure that it's something that you should be listening to age appropriately, right? So thanks everybody for being here. We're going to get right into this topic here this morning. We're back on dysfunctional families from from the Madrashram Institute of Spiritual Studies, and I just found this article very interesting. Um, there's uh, we're for sure about three quarters of the way down through the article, and I think we can probably finish it off this week, and um, you know if not. Thursday morning, uh, then Saturday morning for sure. But it's really interesting what, what George A. Boyd has to say here from the Mudrashram. That's M U D R A S H R A M, mudrashram.com, www.mudrashram.com forward slash dysfunctional family two. That's the number two, dot HTML. And we've been talking about this whole um, for, you know, boundaries and also. Um, changing the negative behaviors from our past. I think, you know, this is where we sort of left off. And uh, self-affirmations, talking about that a little bit. And uh, talking about our subconscious, the conscious, uh, the co- our own conscious and subconscious, right? So, there's we're talking about metaprogramming. And you go, we left off sort of in this area. And I'll just read right from the page. He says, another kind of self-programming is called processing. In this method, you have the self-direction portion of your mind. Ask your subconscious mind a series of questions. So in the self-direction portion of our mind might start to ask our subconscious mind things. Like, for instance, you may ask your, you may ask your subconscious mind, for example, what makes you afraid of heights? What is it that makes you attracted to men or women who abuse you? What is it that makes you so angry about that? And why do you feel this behavior is wrong? These types of questions, right? What is it like when you? What was it like when you were five, growing up? What is keeping you from running the 100-yard dash just a little bit faster? What is it? What is it you really want in your, in your, career? These are types. These are questions that we might ask our subconscious. 
Surprisingly enough, it says your subconscious likely has an answer to whatever you may ask it, and it will give you direct answers and will often reveal the hidden truth about whatever is troubling you. And all you have to do is ask, and then listen for the answer. And George A. Boyd says here, you may wish to write it down as well as so you can refer to it later. So if you write it down, you can go back and look at it. Affirmation and, and processing will allow you to get in touch with your basic feelings, thoughts, and beliefs, and to change them to a certain degree. For the stubborn, uh, recalcitrant, and deeply ingrained patterns and attitudes, however, affirmation and processing may not necessarily work. For these, you need to bring out the heavy guns of metaprogramming. So this is kind of where we left off on Saturday. Metaprogramming, I just never heard of this stuff before, uh, especially in, in these terms, right? <clears throat> so metaprogramming means directing or changing your behavior and conditioning from an even deeper portion of you called the metaconscious mind. And metaconscious mind brings the, the following functions to bear on your basic condi conditioning, and that's resolution, rehearsal, argument, uh, planning, and reflection, insight, self-awareness, these types of things. And we'll just read through those. So this is getting in touch with a deeper part of our, like a... Uh, um, a deeper portion of our mind, right? Metaconscious mind, which is stuff that, you know, I really don't know a whole lot about. I haven't done any real studies on the, you know, conscious, subconscious, what levels, uh, you know, people people's minds have, you know. So this is all kind of interesting for me. Uh, resolution, he says, getting mad at, fed up with, and tired of old behavior and habit patterns, and deciding emotionally to do something about it. That's what we were talking about on Saturday. Uh, you know, making a resolution, like to get help, or making a resolution to to not allow people to abuse us, making a resolution to um, have a good life, making a resolution to, you know, to stop self-sabotaging, these types of things. That's what, and, and really, that's what I did. I made a resolution about four and a half years ago. Well, it's not quite four and a half years, but it's almost it's getting close. And, um, you know, to, I made a resolution to actually uh, allow myself to heal. I really didn't know, you know, I, at that, that's when I started my healing journey because I, before that, was feeling like a victim and was miserable and just always, uh, con, you know, planning my suicide, wanting to self injure. Uh, during the day, working fine, no problem. I used to work uh, full time jobs and sometimes part time jobs together. Like I'd, I'd put in sometimes 16 hour days, and I was fine at work as long as I was busy and I was with people, having a good time, laughing and joking around. And then get home at, at the end of the day, sitting on the couch at night, and all my real life from the past, well, not, not my current life, but my past, my past would come back to haunt me, right? And this would be a, a regular basis. This would be like something that would happen like all the time. Because obviously I can't change what happened to me in the past. You know, I know who I was as a little girl. I know what happened to me. I know what happened to my family, you know. Um, and just this whole knowledge of the abuse, you know, and, and the dysfunction and the destruction of our family would come back and kind of haunt me on a regular basis. And then I'd go to work the next day, everything would be great, you know, do my thing, do the job, come home, sit on the couch and be miserable again. Right? This was my, it's like a pattern, right? So I finally, four and a half years ago, uh, made a resolution, a commitment to myself that I was going to allow myself to heal, to learn how to deal with this stuff, put the past where it belongs in the past, and also, and learn how to deal with it. I feel better about myself and feel better about this life and uh, my, uh, you know, learn how to deal with my dysfunctional family members who are still living, which right now I've cut off because I just can't deal with them right now. I don't know if I'll ever, we, 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 you know, try to contact them or be in contact with them again, you know. Um, I don't think it's really worth it to me. Uh, they are abusive. And they're expecting me to play out this role, <clears throat> this role that was given to me by my parents years and years ago. We all had a role. We were all given this role of being... Uh, of being subservient to abusive people, right? And so we're not allowed to speak our mind. We're not allowed to say what bothered us. We're not allowed to to be honest about our feelings, right, within the family. Because if we do, then we're, we, as children, we're just screamed at and beat on. Uh, with my siblings, uh, screamed at. And my siblings now would not uh, physically hurt me. But the thing is, is they will emotionally drag me down into the gutter because that's where they are, right? Um, they don't, want me to heal, right? So they, they're they not happy that I'm on my healing journey. Not one of them, even though they know what I'm doing, has come forward uh, for the last two years to say, you know what, we're so happy that you're that you're doing so good and that you're healing and that you're, you know, I mean, even if we don't agree with what you're doing, going public with the story and all that, we, we're happy for you as a person that you're going to succeed 
and that you're going to, to be able to go on and have a good life instead of suffer like that. But they didn't care that I was suffering. See, you know, as a child, they didn't care either. They watched my mother beat on me relentlessly, uh, including bloody beatings where, you know, I mean, I'd be having blood loss and uh, quite sick from the beating, quite ill. And uh, they didn't care. You know, it's because they grew up in the same home that I did uh, where there was no compassion, no empathy, and no ability to help each other out. We were all on our own in that home. And so, you know, as an adult, I'm supposed to continue to roll on. And they don't like the fact that I'm going, that I'm, that I'm moving forward and moving past this stuff, because they're not. See, so by me doing this, it forces them to to realize that their situation, you know, and they don't like that. It makes them uncomfortable because because of what I'm doing. It forces them to come with to reality, to, to grips with reality that that uh, if they want to be in denial, they can be, but that uh, I refuse to be in denial. So. You know, it puts a bit of a wall between us, you know, so I don't know if I'll ever talk to them again, but I don't care because I'm going to move on and have a good life. If they don't want to be part of it, that's, I can't, they can't be part of it the way that they are, dysfunctional and abusive, because I, I, I just won't tolerate that anymore, right? That's the whole issue. I made a resolution. I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to hang around with people who are abusive, right? So that's my family. They're very abusive. There's the, the few that are left. They still are, right? And uh, co, you know, dysfunctional, codependent, and uh, if 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 they don't get their way, then they run me down into the mud. Well, you're just like your brothers. You're just like Howard. You're just like, you're just a loser. You're just this. You're just that. Look at you, always the same thing. And that's the same stuff. You know, they're doing the same thing that my mother was doing to me, just degrading me, putting me down, always making me look like a uh, like a an idiot, trying to make me look stupid, trying to make make me feel bad, right? And because for years and years, you know, I had to put up with that and accept it because I was the last, the youngest child, you know, they're expecting me to continue on to accept their, their abusive behavior. And I refuse, see? So that was my resolution, you know? And so it does, you know, cause things to happen. There are consequences to this. But the issue is is that I wanted to heal and I wanted to move forward. And the only way I could do this was to face what happened to me as a child and to face what happened to me as a young adult. You know, and to face all this stuff, and so in order to do that, you know, I kind of had to, you know, let go of my abusive, dysfunctional, codependent, uh, mentally ill family. Right? They're all mentally ill, every single one of them, and uh, you know, they all have their own issues. And it's like if they don't want to get help, that's their own problem. You know, I'm getting help, and I'm moving forward, and I'm going to have a good, healthy life. Right? And so, you know, sometimes you, you know, for not for everybody, but for me. Like, I had to let go of my dysfunction, my dysfunctional, abusive, codependent family, right? There's only a few of us left, like I said. Um, you know, it just, it was the only thing I could do really to save myself, was to cut them off. Because they'll, they'll continue to drag me down um, and continue to berate me and make me feel like my mother used to make me feel, which was just so, like nothing, useless, worthless, uh, no good, bad, right? Evil, hurtful, blaming me. My family blames me for the abuse my mother put on me. Now, I don't know how it could be my fault that a, a 300, or nearly 300 pound, nearly six foot tall woman who was manic depressive and highly, highly volatile and violent, uh, abusive woman, how, how it was my fault that she chose to do what she did to me, as well as verbally berate me my whole life, emotionally abuse me, neglect, psychological, you know, we're talking the whole thing. So, so my family, so what they do is they don't want to put the blame where it goes, which is on my parents, right, my, the, my, the rest of my siblings and, and some of the other family. There's a couple of nephews and niece, niece and nephew involved there, but it's not their fault. They don't know what's going on. But my siblings do because they grew up in the same home I did. You know, and they wanted to kill my parents. As a matter of fact, one of my, you know, one of my siblings wanted to kill my dad, you know, and yet today would back up my dad uh, just so that he doesn't have to be, just so he doesn't have to... Uh, come out of his denial, right? If he backs me up, that means that he has to he has to realize he has to accept what happened to all of us as children. But if he backs my abuser dad, then he can continue to be in denial. And that's what my sister's doing. She's backing up my abuser dad as well because she does not want to come to terms with what happened to me. You know, like I told my old my, my sister who was five five years older than me, that my brother sexually abused me when I was eight years old and she said absolutely nothing. She just sat there, cold, stone, cold. That's just how she is. She doesn't, like, she cannot 
accept that because then that means that she has to accept the dysfunctional, abusive environment that we grew up in. And she doesn't want to accept it. She's she's in denial, see? So, see, I can't hang around with those guys. So I made a resolution. So sometimes these resolutions that we make, you know, they're pretty heavy duty and pretty serious. And um, But I think that it's it's up to each and every one of us to make, you know, to make these resolutions based on what our needs are. You know what I mean? So, I will, you know, not everybody's going to have to, to go to such drastic, you know, measures, which would be to cut off a dysfunctional family. But sometimes you have to. And, you know, for me, in order to survive, in order to continue to move forward in my healing journey, you know, I had to actually cut them off. And the the minute I made the resolution to do that, which was actually this last fall, I felt so much better because I realized they could no longer get their clutches on me. They could no longer hurt me. They could no longer continue to abuse me the way that my parents did. And And even my abuser dad, who's almost 90 years old, can no longer abuse me psychologically, emotionally, right? Because that's what he still continues to do. He, he's, he's mentally ill. He's borderline schizophrenic. And he's got all kinds of borderline personality problems. Now, to his friends, he's just a wonderful man. And everybody that meets him loves him. To his family, he's a, a horrible, mean, miserable man. And so, you know, it, he's just sick, right? So that's the whole issue. I, I feel bad for him, but you know, he, he never wanted to get any help so and he never did get any help, so it's kind of his own own responsibility there, not mine. Rehearsal is another issue. Role playing, uh, new verbal behavior, mentally practicing new movements, visualizing yourself acting in a new way, having new things and people in your life and being a different person. So rehearsal, role playing, new verbal behavior, new way of talking, new way of speaking, mentally practicing new new movements. You know, sort of getting rid of some of these dysfunctional, uh, abusive type behaviors or, you know, know, behaviors that just, you know, are not healthy or whatever. And and seeing, visualizing ourselves in a new way, right? And having new things in people in our lives. I think that's what they're talking about here. And being a different person. I mean, pretty much that's what happened to me. I mean, I'm the same person that I was when I was a kid, you know, and and a young teenager, especially when I developed into my personality. But I think we're always kind of developing, right? But I mean, you know, I'm the same person. But I had to change the way that I was, you know, over the period, over the course of, of years. Because I was brought up in a hate, right? I was brought up in a house full of hate and evil, right? So I carried, I was actually a reflection of that, right? I was a reflection of my parents. That's why a lot of people like to run down these teenagers who are out on the streets and stuff. Sometimes they do come from good homes, but sometimes they don't. Like so, you know, you got to imagine how many teens are out running around on the streets at any given time. And you know, a lot of people like to run them down. I've heard people like I'm an older adult, right? I'm, I'm in my mid forties, and I've heard people say stuff like, "Oh, look at those stupid punks. You know, they should just go home." And what's the matter with them out on the streets? If I was their parent, I'd really give it to them and stuff. And I'm thinking that's probably why they're on the street because their parents are giving it to them. You know what I mean? They're they're abusing them. So that's a lot of kids you know, are a reflection of their parents. You know, not all, but some. And I know that I was a complete reflection of my parents, right? My parents were, I was just modeling my parents' behavior as a teenager, right? Um, just uh, didn't matter if I hurt people, didn't matter if my parents hurt us. So for me, you know, I didn't have a problem hurting people. I didn't have a problem hurting even myself. My parents didn't mind hurting themselves. They were suicidal. They were... Um, dysfunctional, they were completely abusive, and they were always thinking to themselves, never their children. And so, you know, that, that was me as a teenager, you know what I mean? It was really all about me, you know, and I was doing a whole lot of drugs, and I had a really bad attitude and a huge chip on my shoulder. And, um, you know, I had, I had a few friends that could see through it, you know, but the the majority of people just thought that 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 was my personality just because, especially if they didn't know, you know, what was going on in my home. You know, some of my closest friends obviously knew what was going on in my home. But, the, you know, some people didn't and probably thought, yeah, she's just a jerk, you know, look at how she behaves. And, you know, I carried that behavior right into my 20s, right? And then I finally realized at the age of 21 I needed to straighten up some behaviors, otherwise I was never going to be able to um, function as an adult. So I had to, had to kind of become a different person even at that point, right? And then all through my 30s, it was all about my mother. You know? So then when my mother passed away, 
and I have, in my 30s, I had to kind of learn how to become a, a different person. So it's been a metamorphosis, you know, it's been a, a change, you know, uh, and, and hopefully in, in the right direction. I do believe that it's happened in the right direction because obviously I'm on my healing journey now, which four and a half years ago I wanted to kill myself again, right? This was something I've been wanting to do since I was a kid. So, you know, this is the thing, right? It's been for the better, and it's taken me a lot. I guess we have a lifetime to do these things, however long we live, right? So it's not, shouldn't judge, shouldn't, I guess, you know, uh, measure it against time. It takes the time that it takes to do these things, right? But I would say whatever you do, you know, you make sure if you if you've survived, uh, you know, abuse and grew up in a dysfunctional, abusive home, and you've just been inundated with the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the horrible, you know, aftermath of being abused, you know, that you would get some help, um, even if it's as friends or you know, if you don't trust counselors or therapists, or if you need a counselor and therapist, because all of us are different. Right, we all need different things, but I would say you know just to make sure that you do get some help and do not allow yourself to go down and and spiral down and suffer because of this you know because we certainly deserve so much better, and we can get help, you know what I mean, like I know myself that was part of my resolution to myself and my commitment to myself was that if I started to spiral out of control, that I would go with some professional help, you know what I mean, because my brothers killed themselves. Right. And they had every opportunity to get help. One of my brothers was in prison for quite a few years, seven years or whatever. And uh, it was for something stupid. He had a, he found a, an old gun. in. Uh, he used to work up north in the in the oil camp, you know, the drilling camps up north here in Canada. And he, in this ice field, found this old weapon, or this old gun from like, I don't know, it was really old anyway. And the wood was all rotted away. And he was bringing it into the city to give it to a museum. This is, you know, because it was like a museum piece. And he got, you know, of course, up in here in Canada, you cannot carry a gun. Now, this is the story that he told us anyway, so who really knows what really happened? But um, because he was a drug user and he was always in trouble, you know, he was always robbing banks and stuff. And, you know, he was, um, you know, he was just living this life that my parents set up for him. People would say, oh, he could have made better choices. Well, he could have had he not been bashed in the head so many times that he almost, that he just lost his brain, you know what I mean? The poor guy. And not only that, but, my parents didn't get him any help. He was doing drugs at the age of 12 years old or even younger. And, you know, most parents would not allow their children to use drugs, but my parents did not care. That's what I'm saying. People do not get a clue or grip. There's people in there that were friends of my parents that actually know what I'm doing and speaking out. I hope that they listen to these shows because they seem to think that all oh, my parents were perfect. And they were wonderful. And my mom baked cookies. My dad was so nice. And it's like, you people make me sick because you have no concept, you know what I mean, of what manipulators will do, right? My parents were very manipulative, and they could be so nice to other people. Oh, sure, abusers are nice to other people. That's how they get away with what they're doing. They're not going to go abusing all the whole neighborhood and draw attention to themselves. No, they're going to be nice to everybody else, and they're going to abuse their family. That's who they're going to abuse, behind closed doors. And so, you know, my parents didn't mind abusing us out in public, right? My parents were brought up on charges, so they didn't care. But the issue is, is there's a whole bunch of people that were blinded by these guys. You know what I mean? Um, and my my brothers were horrifically treated, horrifically by my dad, and and even by my mom. You know, but mainly by my dad. And so they didn't have a chance, right? So that's why they they that's why they had the adult lives that they had. But I really wish that they would have gotten some help. And um, you know, they had the opportunity to get help. And one of my older siblings, uh, who's still living today, actually did help them out as much as he could. And really did try to be that person for them um, to help them in it with whatever he could. And then they still killed themselves. You know, my bro kind of took it hard. And it, it hurt. I think what it did is it just it hurt my brother so badly that he couldn't help them that he turned into this hard case that he, he doesn't care about anybody now. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about anybody. He doesn't even care about himself. I don't think he's so, uh, well, he's so damaged really from being abused as a child he left the home at 16 years old and he couldn't take it he was with him because he was living on the street you know he was just like he basically just ran away but see my parents didn't care you could you could run away my parents were, we were throwaways like they didn't care if we left the house and never came back right they weren't going to go look for us they'd be like oh well there's another one gone good let's see how many more we can get out of here my parents did not want us i wish people would and i, I wish people that knew me would listen to my shows because there's a whole lot of people that like my parents and, and 
I support my parents and back up my parents. And they have, and I, I kind of want to say shame on you to those people. Because to me, to ignore the fact that somebody could do that to their children and just think, you know, and have this adult relationship with them, knowing, you know, what they've done to their children and to their wife or to their, you know, it, it just, you know, I just sit there and shake my head. I'm like, you know, shame on those people for befriending somebody who could destroy and and, and really soul murder their family, right? Because that's what it was, soul murder. We were killed spiritually and in every other way. And so, you know, I know that there's a judgment and that's what gets me through. But anyway, so the, the, the issue is, is we we have to not allow this stuff to... That's why I'm always saying, you know, do not allow this abuse to destroy you, right? Because that's what I decided for myself. I thought, man, I'm not going to allow this abuse that, that happened to me, uh, destroy me, as you know, that happened to me as a child. I'm going to learn how to deal with this. So really, in essence, I'm kind of doing that rehearsal role, playing a new verbal behavior, mentally practicing new movements, visualizing myself in a different way. You know, having new things and people in my life and being a different person, right? Pretty much that's sort of what I've been doing. You know what I mean? I have a lot of good friends. I've got a lot of good support. People who have really rallied around me to help me out. Um, I have a sweetheart in my life who treats me very well. He's a, he's an awesome, lovely man. He's uh, terminally ill. And we're we're still together. We'll be together to to the end uh, as long as, as many days as he has left. And, um, you know, he's a good man. And so I have these good people in my life. That's why I don't mind closing the door of my abusers, right? My my abusive, dysfunctional family. I'm not staying together with them just to keep the quote unquote family together, which is what my dad wants. He, my dad, you know, bugs on a regular basis. He's almost 90 and he's pretty much dying. Um, you know, got to keep the quote unquote family together. I'm like, what family? You destroyed it years ago. What what family? What what do we have? We have nothing. Me and my siblings don't even have any real um, bond. There's no bond. My sister abused me as a child, right? The one who's five years older and still living. You know, she was abusive towards me. You know, she was she was just doing what what my mother was doing, kicking me, beating on me, uh, turning me in, you know, to the school authorities for whatever reason, turning me into my mother for for no reason, uh, getting me in trouble. You know, my sister was not my friend. She was my foe. She was my enemy, right? So now she wants to hang out. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I've already hung out with her long enough, and her dysfunction, I just can't deal with it anymore because I don't have a right to my own opinion. The minute I, I, I speak my opinions, she's screaming at me like my mother. And my mother used to scream at me at the top of her voice. Laurie! You know, this is what, this, now this is what my sister does to me. As a 40, my sister's 50 years old. And if, if she does not like something or agree with something I've said, she screams at me like my mother and looks exactly like my mother. She's just, she's my mother all over again, <laughs> right? So why would I want to hang around with her? You know what I mean? I'm like, no, I'm done. I'm done with that. Even one of my other siblings, the other one that's living, there's only there's only two of them, um, said that she is exactly like my mother, like our mother, because he recognizes that in her too. And she doesn't recognize that because she thinks our mother was just the most wonderful, sweetest person on the planet. Yeah, the mother who bashed my head in with a rolling pin and could have killed me. Uh, the mother that beat me with a table leg, the mother that beat me with belts on a regular basis, uh, the mother that put her fist in my face uh, on a regular basis, you know, slap me around, call me names, throw things at me, make me sleep in my own throw up, you know. Um, that's a good mother to my sister. In my sister's eyes, that's a good mother. I, I'm not hanging around with her anymore, you know what I mean? So I had to get I had to get some new different people in my life who were, and that's that whole issue of, of of uh, boundaries, what we're going to allow and what we're not going to allow. And I refuse to allow my dysfunctional family to have anything more to do with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? My abusers, right? Because that's what they are. Um, so, you know, in doing so, we have to then reach out and get help from other sources. And we have to make sure that the people that we are hanging around with are good people who are going to treat us properly, that we're not going to allow any more abuse in our life, right? So important. So, well, on Thursday, we'll take a look at argument and the rest of this. Argument as well as pla uh, planning, reflection, insight, self-awareness, and whatnot. So you can check this out, www.mudrashram.com, dysfunctionalfamily2.html. And um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it. Make sure you get some help. You know, if you've suffered along in this, you've been abused as a child, do not allow this to, to destroy your life. You know, we deserve so much better. That's what. And, but we have to get it. We have to go out and get that. We can't expect somebody else to deliver healing on a plate. It's not going to happen. 
I used to th- I used to think that was going to happen. I thought somebody would be able to help me. Uh, somebody somebody would be able to do that for me. And I didn't realize it was going to have to be me until the age of 41. And I really wish that I would have realized this many, many years ago, especially at like the age of 31, right? So reach out, you know, get get some help, whatever you do. If you can't find somebody to talk to, then you call a crisis line. You know, you do what you have to do to stay alive and keep yourself well. Because I know what it's like to be on that other side in hell. And so I know how hard it is. It takes a lot of courage and guts to make the phone call. But you know what? If you've survived abuse, you've already survived the worst of it. And it's it's once you're on your your path to to allowing yourself to heal, you know, then you gain more courage by reaching out even more, a little more courage, reaching out some more. You know what I mean? And and getting some help wherever it may be, friends, you know, someone new you trust, who you, who you can count on, you know. And if you don't have somebody like that in your life, which many times people don't, uh, you know, they're on their own. I know I've been on my own for many years in my lifetime. Um, you know, in my 30s and, and 20s. Then you call a crisis line, but you do whatever you have to do to, to stay alive and stick it out, right? Have a great day, everybody. I'll be back on my shows tonight as well as Dreamcatchers Talk Radio here tonight, as well as my own show, Child Abuse Prevention and Human Rights Abuse Prevention is up to us. Take good care of yourselves, everybody. Have a good day.